may come up under times of stress that may create this sense of our being untrustworthy to patients. Just as an aside, if you'd like to find out a little bit more about your implicit attitudes, here's a website that I would invite you all to visit. And in the privacy of your own virtual world, your own internet space, you can do a test. And they have them for not only race and ethnicity, but they have them for age and gender and a variety of other isms that might be out there. And you might get a look at some of the implicit attitudes that you hold, again, privately. And it might, be, it might tell you a little bit about yourself. So what's at stake here? I think we can all agree that trust and trustworthiness are fundamental aspects of all human relationships, not just in healthcare. But that trust and trustworthiness in physicians and in healthcare is important. It's been correlated with very important patient outcomes. Patients are more satisfied, and when they're more satisfied, they'll comply, they'll participate more in the decision-making process. It certainly improves the communication, your ability to get that crucial information from patients. They'll be more involved in prevention activities, more involved in research trials. Lots of important outcomes when trust and trustworthiness is present. Particularly the prevalence of disparities really calls for us to have a better understanding of all the complexities of trust and trustworthiness. And if anything, I hope you'll take away that it's, trust is not one monolithic concept, and nor can I, could you ever reduce someone's trust stance to one simple description. It's very complex. But with that in mind, what can we do about this idea of race, ethnicity, and trust and our own trustworthiness? Coming back to Herman Shaw, even with egregious abuses, even with the presence, presence of something that we call dispositional trust, it's never too late to work to restore trust and faith. So how do you do that? I think this model is a helpful rep frame of reference. Again, I said in the beginning, if you have some sense of what trust is, the various facets of trust, it then gives you a road map of how you can perceive yourself or begin to work on areas in yourself to become more trustworthy. So let's take some of these for example. If to increase the ability for a situation to be perceived as trustworthy, and let's take each of those areas. So if in trusting, the first thing is you need to be very, very clear of your fiduciary responsibilities in any encounter. Do you have conflicts of interest? I'm not saying that it's wrong to have conflicts of interest. We all multitask. But you need to be clear of that. You need to be mindful of that before you enter the encounter. And in all circumstances, let's hope that you can put the patient's needs first. And if you can't, that you're able to disclose what other conflicts are there. Let's take the idea of competence. Now we said that patients may have some subjective criteria. It may be the way you dress, or it might be your training or your credentials. One of the things that you can do is, well, first of all, make sure you are competent. You know, taking a course like this is one way that you certainly can increase your competence in a variety of areas, not only in the area of genetics, but also in cultural humility and cultural competence, cultural sensitivity. So always work to cultivate and maintain your skills and knowledge. But ask patients. Ask them what's important to you, what criteria, how do you know if someone's competent, what's important to them, be willing to ask that. And about this idea of caring and altruism, this sort of warm, fuzzy thing, there is where communication is truly important. Be able to be able to communicate, and particularly using those skills that foster, as I mentioned, cultural humility and cultural competence. What about this area of situational dispositional trust? Again, I really encourage everyone to honestly examine any attitudes that you may implicitly hold about certain populations. Once you identify them, say if you go to this website and you have some picture now of some biases or stereotypes you may hold, you need to start working on that. You need to do what you need to do to eliminate the behaviors that patients may feel are discriminatory. And how could you do that? Well, know about the communities that you work with. That's really important. 
But ask also, this is where the situational piece comes in, ask if they have had any past situations that they feel have, may have engendered mistrust. You can simply ask, have you ever felt unfairly treated by me or anyone else involved in your care? And once you ask a question like that, you need to trust yourselves. You need to trust that the patient's answer is their truth. The wrong response would be to say, oh, no, no, you're mistaken. That didn't happen. You misinterpreted me. You need to stop a moment and say, this is that patient's truth. This is their experience. And so the next step would be to, to apologize and assure the patient that you're going to act differently in the future. It's said that when President Clinton apologized for the Public Health Service's participation in the syphilis study, that it caused a great deal of healing to occur. So that as a model, don't be afraid to apologize if you hear that you have unconsciously wronged someone or behaved in a way that was perceived as untrustworthy. But not only that, identify behaviors of the system you're working in, other staff members, or the healthcare institution itself. And when specific incidents are reported, ensure that follow-up through appropriate quality assurance processes can help, can be put in place to correct any systemic problems that you identify. So in summary, I think that Regardless of the idea of dispositional trust and its justification, you need to focus on the idea of situations and to cultivate your trustworthiness in situations that, in the actual patient encounters that you have. But also inform yourself about potential dispositional problems. Think about the communities you serve. Are there salient historical or political issues? that you need to be aware of. Don't stereotype. And particularly in research, if you're analyzing data, particularly data on race and ethnicity, don't presume that mistrust explains your results unless you've measured it. So I thank you.